justified invasion. First, however, I'd like to share with you uh, that Secretary Austin uh, spoke with Ukrainian Minister of Defense uh, Reznikov yesterday to discuss Ukraine's uh, military requirements as fighting continues in eastern Ukraine. Secretary Austin highlighted the success of the Ukraine contact group uh, held on May 23rd and noted the unity of, international of the international community in supporting Ukraine as it repels the Russian invasion. Minister Reznikov expressed his gratitude for U.S. leadership on this effort, and the two leaders outlined priorities for the next in-person contact group planned for June in Brussels. And now for today's announcement. Uh, today, President Biden directed the drawdown of an additional $700 million in weapons and equipment from the Department of Defense inventories. The capabilities in this package are tailored to meet critical Ukrainian needs for today's fight, including requirements for rocket artillery. This authorization is the 11th drawdown of equipment from DOD inventories for Ukraine since August of 2021. The capabilities in this package include High Mobility Artillery Rocket Systems, or HIMARS, and guided munitions with a range of up to 70 kilometers, five counter-artillery radars, two air surveillance radars, 1,000 additional javelins and 50 command launch units, 6,000. Equipment. These are critical capabilities to help the Ukrainians repel the Russian offensive in the east. One such need is the high mobility artillery rocket system I just mentioned, which responds to Ukraine's top priority ask. This system will provide Ukraine with additional precision in targeting at range. The Ukrainians have given us assurances that they will use this system for defensive purposes only. In anticipation of this potential decision by President Biden, the Department of Defense pre-positioned the HIMARS systems in Europe to ensure that they could be rapidly delivered to the Ukrainians and put in place a plan so that we could start training Ukrainian forces immediately while ensuring they learn how to operate the system safely and effectively, as well as to maintain the system. We will continue to closely consult with Ukraine and surge additional available systems and capabilities in support of its defense. I would also like to acknowledge and express our appreciation for the strong bipartisan approval in Congress of $40 billion to support the U.S. response in Ukraine. This additional support included $8 billion in additional presidential drawdown authority for security assistance, $6 billion under DOD's Ukraine Security Assistance Initiative, and $4 billion in State Department foreign military financing for Ukraine and countries impacted by the situation in Ukraine. This is the first security assistance package announced since the additional supplemental was signed by President Biden. The United States has now committed approximately $5.3 billion in security assistance to Ukraine since the beginning of the Biden administration, including approximately $4.6 billion since the beginning of Russia's unprovoked invasion on February 24th. Even as we continue to provide vital assistance, I would be remiss if I failed to recognize and commend our allies and partners from more than 40 countries who have joined us to continue supporting Ukraine with heavy weapons, munitions, and other vital security assistance. Our support for Ukraine and that of the international community remains unwavering. And finally, I want to thank our dedicated men and women, our service members, civilians, and contractors supporting the department's efforts. From the individual basis sourcing uh, U.S. equipment to Transportation Command providing movement support to our service members on rotation in support of our enhanced presence across U.S. European Command to our own policy professionals here at the Pentagon, the Department has come together in extraordinary ways to support this historic effort. Without our most valuable resource, the never-ending dedication and support of our employees and contractors, this response would not have been possible. And with all that, I'm happy to take your uh, questions. And I think we're slated to start with uh, Ben Fox from AP. Hi. Hey, hey Ben. Um, can you talk about how, how many and how quickly you can get these HMARS, excuse me, HIMARS into the hands of Ukrainian forces? Obviously, time is, is a, of a critical essence right now. All right, so the initial tranche, tranche of HIMARS systems will be four. Uh, as I said, we've already pre-positioned uh, the systems in theater. Uh, so that we can uh, deliver them expeditiously. I think it's important to keep in mind, though, um, these aren't turnkey. These, of course, are systems that the Ukrainians need to be trained on. Uh, we think that'll take around three weeks. Uh, and they need to 
uh, know not just how to use the systems, but of course how to maintain uh, the system. So think of uh, logistics, maintenance, uh, things like that. So it'll be a number uh, of, of weeks uh, until that training is complete. Barb. Um, can I follow up on a couple of things? You mentioned uh, that the Ukrainians had committed that these weapons would be defensive only, but you didn't say that they had promised not to strike targets inside Russia, which they may believe is in the defense of their nation. So my first question is, do you have a specific commitment that they won't strike inside Russia? Yes. And can I follow up then on, um, you said uh, that it's going to be three weeks at, uh, at least of training. Do, do you feel at this point, given the Russian gains in the Donbass, that uh, the Ukrainians can afford those three weeks? Can, uh, how do you push back against the gains the Russians may make in that time? And the administration's talking about this package in terms of putting the Ukrainians in the best possible position at the negotiating table. No longer hearing talk about they may succeed in booting the Russians out of Ukraine. Is this three weeks going to be delaying that prospect, and is that even a reasonable prospect? Sure. Well, Barbara, as you know, uh, the battlefield has changed a lot uh, in the last three months. So obviously, in the first instance, the Russians tried to take over the entire country. They were defeated uh, in the battle for Kyiv. Uh, they've made some progress in the south, and now they're trying to encircle uh, Ukrainian forces in the Donbass. Uh, you're right. Uh, in the last uh, several days, the Russians have made some incremental progress uh, in and around uh, the Donbass. Um, they have not had a decisive breakthrough, uh, and the Ukrainians are putting up a heck of a fight. Um, and right now, it's a concentrated artillery duel uh, in the east. It's why we put so much emphasis on providing 108 uh, M777 uh, howitzers uh, and a couple hundred thousand rounds of, uh, of ammunition. Um, most of those howitzers are currently in the fight, and they're doing, uh, uh, they're helping the Ukrainians a great deal. Uh, so I, I think we're not, we're not seeing the Ukrainian defenses buckle. They're hanging on, uh, but it is a grinding fight, and we believe that these additional capabilities uh, will arrive in a time frame that's relevant uh, and allow the Ukrainians to very precisely target uh, the types of things uh, they need for the current fight. Is three weeks too late? I don't think so. David Martin. Um, <clears throat> defensive purposes only, does that mean they cannot use the HIMARS to go on the offense and expel the Russians from territory they hold? And you said uh, four systems. How many, how many rockets right. for those systems? So Ukraine is defending their territory. Anything they're doing on the territory of Ukraine is defensive uh, in this context. The, only, the, the formal assurance is that they will not use these systems to target uh, Russian territory. Uh, so just to clarify on that. So um, go ahead. Again. Anything, anything they do with these weapons on their territory? They are defending. They have the right uh, as a sovereign nation to defend their territory. They didn't start this war. The Russians did. Uh, and the Russians are on the offensive. Uh, if the Ukrainians are pushing them back uh, from U uh, Ukrainian territory, um, so for example, they, uh, the Ukrainians made a recent push into Kyrgyzstan. Uh, if they uh, push back uh, along uh, the line of contact in the, in the Donbass, uh, we would consider that defensive. Just go over to the and, and Oh, on the number of systems. I'm not going to go into the total number of, of munitions. I would emphasize, however, so there are four systems, uh, but, of, but we are providing them an initial tranche of munitions. Uh, it's important for them to get trained on the systems, to get familiar with the systems. We will be in a position to uh, rapidly surge additional munitions uh, as appropriate in the battlefield evolves. Just go over the phones real quickly. Uh, Jack Dutch from Foreign Policy. Jack, are you there? Now, can you hear me? Hello? Uh, Ukrainians have been asking for the system for about two months now. I'm just curious um, why the decision took took so long on the U.S. side. 
Yeah, well, so the conflict is, is or the, the, the current stage of the conflict is about three months old, and the nature of that conflict has shifted, and the priorities the Ukrainians have had and what we've thought have been most relevant to enable the Ukrainians to push back has changed over time. So in the initial uh, phase of the conflict, especially as the Ukrainians were trying to repel uh, the invasion in and around uh, Kyiv, uh, the capital city, uh, which was an existential fight for the uh, for the heart of, of the country, uh, we were really emphasizing anti-armor systems, like the Javelin systems, anti-air systems like stingers, but also uh, other uh, medium and longer range air defense systems alongside our allies and partners. And that assistance proved uh, uh, decisive in stymieing uh, the Russian uh, um, attempt uh, to take Kyiv. Uh, the Russians were defeated in Kyiv as the conflict shifted uh, to the east, as I said. It's become an artillery duel. The challenge the Ukrainians had is that they relied on Soviet legacy systems. And it be there was a certain point in which it became impossible for the United States, even working with our uh, allies and partners who also had Soviet legacy equipment, to resupply uh, the Ukrainians with the artillery systems and ammunition they were accustomed to using, which meant that the priority was to shift them towards, uh, in this case, Case, uh, 155 uh, millimeter um, uh, artillery systems. We've been uh, providing them the M777 uh, howitzers. Uh, so that was as the as the as the fight shifted to an artillery duel. The first thing was to get these howitzers into the fight, and now we're shifting to HIMARS. Courtney. One quick thing on the training. Um, you said it was uh, about three weeks to train. Does that include the full training for maintaining the systems, or is that just for operating them? Uh, the, the training, you know, it's not always the same Ukrainians who are being trained to operate and maintain, so you can do them both at the same time. Uh, so it's roughly three weeks uh, to train them how to use the system and maybe a couple of additional weeks for the maintainers, but uh, that that's what we're talking about here. And then one uh, more on the, the use of it. The, um, it so is, is it that the, the U.S. sees that if Russia is, is striking at Ukraine from inside Russian territory, that, that the Ukrainians cannot strike back inside Russia, that that's, how is that not considered defensive? And if Ukraine does use these weapons in what they see as a defensive way by striking inside Russia, are there any repercussions for them violating this agreement that they've made? It is true that the Russians are uh, engaged in a number of standoff attacks uh, from Russian territory. So think long-range missile systems or uh, air launch cruise missiles, those, those types of things. The core of the battle, though, right now uh, is on Ukrainian territory in the east. Uh, the systems that we're providing, the HIMARS and the guided uh, munitions that go along with them, will allow Ukraine to range any target they need for that fight inside Ukrainian territory. Um, these systems would not be particularly useful to hit a, you know, a Russian bomber launching an air launch cruise missile you know, hundreds and hundreds of kilometers away anyway. So we think we are giving them the capability they need for this stage of the fight. And any repercussions if they do violate that? They've given us their assurances that they're not going to use these systems for striking Russian territory, and we trust the Ukrainians will live up to those assurances. Fadi? Thank you, uh, Thank you for doing this. So um, we heard before the U.S. delivered the uh, howitzer uh, uh, that this will make a difference in the battlefield. However, we've seen the Russians making advances in the Donbas, regardless of how you assess this these advances. Now we're talking about four systems. I believe each one can carry six rockets, uh, I think. So how much of a difference do you think four systems will make uh, in the battlefield, and especially with, with the Russians' capability of actually targeting them? And then on the time frame of uh, providing these systems, so between training and maintenance and fielding, what are we looking at here? How many weeks? Thank you. Yeah. So on the last question, I'm not going to speculate beyond what I've already said, which is it'll take a few weeks to train them on how to use them. And all, at the same time, you're training a subset of Ukrainians on how to maintain them. Uh, we have prepositioned the systems uh, in Europe already, so they should be able to be delivered expeditiously. But beyond that, I'm not going to go into uh, timing. You know, look, no system is going to turn the war, right? This is a battle of national will. You have, uh, you know, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of uh, men mobilized on, on each side. It is a, it is a grinding, uh, hard uh, conflict, and it's likely to be a conflict, we've said many times, that will stretch on for a, for a long time. Over the entire course of the war, the Russians have not uh, done particularly well. They're certainly off plan. Uh, they had anticipated, uh, you know, taking over the country in a matter of days. Uh, at the outset, maybe 30 days. Uh, they are far off uh, plan. So I'd say, based on kind of 
the general expectations for how the conflict would be going, I think the Ukrainians have done an extraordinary job. And we've, of course, uh, tried to do our part in, in providing them the assistance they need to defend uh, their country alongside allies and partners. What the HIMARS will allow them to do is to get greater standoffs. So right now, uh, the howitzers we provided them have about a 30-kilometer uh, range. The HIMARS have more than twice uh, that, which will allow them, even with fewer systems, greater standoff. And the other thing that distinguishes this is an extraordinary amount of precision. Uh, so this is not something that where you launch off you know, multiple, despite it being a multiple uh, launch rocket system, you actually don't want to la uh, launch off multiple rockets at a time. These are precision-guided uh, systems with extended range. And so for high-value targets that allow them to keep some of the pressure off of Ukrainian forces on the front, we think these systems will be very useful. That's a yes, Thank you. Um, I want to call back to a couple of things you've mentioned. You said that there would be an initial tranche of four arriving in country. When do you anticipate everything will be in country um, and on, on the battlefield, if I could start there? Yeah, I think this is a version of the same question. So I, I, we are shipping four HIMARS systems to the Ukrainians. They won't initially go into Ukraine. Of course, they have to be trained on the on the systems. So I'm not going to go into the details about where they will be, where the training will happen. Uh, the training uh, will take a couple of weeks, uh, three weeks, we think, for uh, to get the, the Ukrainians trained on how to operate the system. There will be some additional training uh, for maintenance. So sometime in that time frame, uh, you can start talking about getting the systems uh, into the fight. So that's roughly a month. To, a month to what period? That is, is are there, how many tranches are there? Well, we have $7.3 billion of additional drawdown authority. So I think we need to see this kind of as a rolling uh, process. As the fight continues to change, the Ukrainians come to us with their priorities. We make our own assessments. We are always measuring things uh, against what the Ukrainians need, our assessment of the battlefield, but also things like the impact that it has on our own armed forces, especially when we're drawing things uh, out of our own uh, stockpiles. And so we think that as they are starting to get trained on the HIMARS systems, we'll continue to have the conversation uh, with the Ukrainians about what the next tranche of security assistance will look like and the tranche after that and the tranche after that. And we're grateful for Congress uh, for appropriating, uh, you know, a sizable sum that will allow us to continue these tranches at fairly regular intervals uh, based on the changes on the battlefield. And then I'd like to ask you about training. U.S. service members train on similar systems or train for months. Um, and I was wondering if you could walk me through how the three-week period was determined. What are the limitations of that training? Does it limit the, the ability of Ukrainian forces to use these systems at their maximum capacity? Yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, we're, we're going to train them uh, uh, to the standard that is required for them to use these uh, systems. I will say uh, the Ukrainians have proven time and time again to be extremely extraordinarily ingenious uh, and quick learners. And so I think we've been able to speed things up uh, in the training cycle based on how uh, quickly the, the Ukrainians have learned systems and been able to integrate them into their uh, activities. And so a special training course was put together specifically for these systems uh, and the Ukrainians that would be trained in our current assessment is that it's in the three three week ish and range. Not taking away anything from them. I don't I don't I mean only time will tell, but I don't think so. I'm just going to go back to the phones. Um, Eric Schmidt from the New York Times. Eric? I have two questions, one, two part question. One is just at what level were these assurances given uh, by the Ukrainian government? Did these go all the way up to President Zelensky speaking to President Biden? And more broadly, can you uh, give us a sense of how you now are calibrating uh, sending these kind of advanced weapons into Ukraine uh, without the fear of provoking uh, Russia, as, as has been a constant concern throughout? So the assurances have been given at multiple levels of the uh, Ukrainian government. Um, uh, Secretary Austin has raised these issues with uh, Minister Reznikov in their numerous calls. They're, they're talking to each other once or twice uh, a week. That has been true since the beginning uh, of the conflict. Uh, but this particular assurance goes all the way to the top of the Ukrainian uh, government, uh, uh, to include President Zelensky. On, on escalation, look, uh, we are mindful of the escalation risk and everything we're doing uh, associated with this. Uh, President Biden has made clear uh, we have no uh, intention of, of coming into direct conflict uh, with Russia. We don't have an interest in the conflict in Ukraine widening uh, to, a, to a broader conflict or evolving into World War III. Um, so we've been mindful of that. Uh, but at the same time, Russia doesn't get a veto uh, over what we send to the Ukrainians. Uh, the Ukrainians didn't start this war. The Russians did. Uh, the Ukrainians didn't provoke uh, this war. This war was unprovoked. 
out. Uh, the Russians can end this conflict anytime they want. If they are wary of escalation, they it all it takes is one man to say stop, uh, uh, and they can do it. So we are mindful of the escalation risk, but in the first instance, we're focused on what we think the Ukrainians need uh, for the current fight. Thanks, Eric. We've got time for just two more. Uh, Tara. Thank you. Um, hi, Tara Kraft, that's one. Uh, I want to get back to the escalation question. You know, with each of these tranches, each of these drawdowns, we've seen more advanced weapons systems being given to Ukraine. At what point does it become too advanced and you kind of uh, risk running that escalation where you might provoke Russia? And then secondly, specifically on the HIMARS, um, you said the first four are going to Ukraine. How many systems do you envision sending to Ukraine? Uh, what are the limitations there? So on the on the latter, we'll just have to see. We're providing this initial tranche that'll allow for uh, training, familiarization, start to get the systems in the fight. Um, it'll also be, uh, you know, we need to get information too, and the Ukrainians too, about how useful they are and how they're being and how they're being used on the battlefield. That'll give us an assessment and them an assessment about what additional systems or capabilities they they uh, might need. In terms of, you know, hypothetically, what assets we, you know, or systems we may provide in the future and how we manage escalation, it's, I'm, I'm not going to get into hypotheticals. I'll just say that we are constantly assessing this. But we're not the ones provoking Russia, and Ukraine is not the ones uh, provoking Russia. The Russians uh, uh, engaged in this uh, further invasion of, of Ukraine completely unprovoked, based on a set of fabricated, uh, largely fabricated grievances against uh, the Ukrainians and a denial that Ukraine even deserves uh, uh, to exist. So the onus is on Russia to de-escalate. Uh, they can de-escalate any time uh, they want. Uh, we are mindful that uh, we don't want to take steps that widen the conflict. Uh, and so some of the assurances uh, that uh, we've asked for in the context of these particular systems are mindful of that, of not wanting these systems to be used to attack Russian territory. But the Ukrainians are defending their land, their territory against an unprovoked aggressor. They have the right to defend that land. This is a super quick follow up on the number of HIMARS. Beyond the four, can you give us a ballpark sense of the capacity the U.S. has to send additional systems? I don't want to go into too much detail. We have we have a fair amount of capacity. Uh, we certainly have room to grow, um, but let's see how the battlefield evolves. All right, one last question, Nick Schiff from PBS. Thanks very much, um, Colin. The Ukrainians, as you know, were were asking for the longer range ammunition. So, what difference does it make if the ammunition fires 40 miles or 170 miles if the Ukrainians are promising not to fire it across the border? Yeah, I mean, we had a bunch. Of, we had back and forth with them, Nick, on this. Uh, and as we looked at the at the targets that they were looking to be able to uh, go after on Ukrainian territory, um, and also have some additional standoff, uh, we thought that the HIMARS with the with the Gimlers uh, rounds, these guided uh, uh, long range rounds with about a seventy uh, kilometer range, could service any target that they needed precisely. Um, and so we settled on the on the HIMARS with the with the Gimler, Gimler's round uh, as the appropriate round at this time. We don't assess that they need systems that range out hundreds and hundreds of kilometers for the current fight. Um, and so that's how we settled on it. And then, then the zoomed out question: To what end uh, are, are these weapons being provided? Obviously, we've asked yeah. versions of this questions in various agencies in the last couple of days. But if you don't think uh, that HIMARS in particular are, are some magic weapon that can suddenly evict Russia from occupied Kherson or change the battlefield. What is the vision uh, from this building uh, on how these increasingly modern weapons can help Ukraine either on the battlefield or whether a diplomatic uh, venue starts? What is that vision? Well, first of all, I think the, the, the president was pretty articulate about that today in today's uh, uh, New York Times op-ed. So I'd encourage you all, even if you're from a rival uh, media institution, uh, to read uh, uh, read the uh, read the New York Times op-ed today. I'll just say this: in in the first instance, um, the Ukrainians will decide what success looks like. But we all have a vested interest. The entire free world has a vested interest in ensuring that Ukraine survives as a sovereign, territorial, democratic country. Uh, this is an assault on Ukraine, but it's also an assault on the rules-based international order. It's important that a sovereign, independent, democratic Ukraine endures. It's important that Russia pays a cost in excess to the benefits that they perceive from this act of aggression, not just because aggression should be punished, but because we don't want uh, Vladimir Putin to do this again. And we don't want other would-be aggressors to draw the lesson uh, that aggression uh, won't be met with uh, significant costs. 
Now, the military component of that is part of it. Um, it is obviously an, a very important part in, in enabling Ukraine to defend its sovereign uh, uh, territory and to maintain its independence. But it's not the only thing that we're doing. There's obviously a massive diplomatic effort uh, to isolate Russia diplomatically, to impose crippling economic sanctions, uh, to put in place uh, technology export controls, which will make very difficult for Russia to uh, rebuild the military. It is rapidly attriting uh, in this conflict. So we are imposing uh, significant costs on Russia, not because we have animus towards Russia or the Russian people, but because this was an act of unprovoked aggression, and there has to be a cost uh, for that. But in terms of the final end state, we'll see, uh, you know, the Ukrainians are going to determine what uh, success uh, looks like, and it's our job to enable them uh, to uh, do well on the battlefield and to position themselves well at the negotiating table. Thanks, everyone. If you have follow-up questions or you didn't get your question answered, the press team is available to take your questions. Thanks for coming.